All right, let's see what time is it? One o'clock, um, hopefully we'll have a few more people. Looks like Doug just joined, Mark's here, Carol's here. So we have Carol and Mark uh, from VMware and the Dispatch Project. Doug, the infamous Doug from IBM and our leader of the serverless working group and Simon, I'm not sure if, um, hey, hey Simon, you wanna do a brief intro? Yeah, hi. Um, so I work for Red Hat. I've been working with Matthias Westendorf, who's been yep. a bit more engaged with this group than I have. Um, mm -hmm. I sat in on the last call uh, when I was with a face to face with Matthias. Um, Matthias is on vacation today and for the next two weeks. So, um, so uh, I want to sit in and sort of contribute where I can do. Um, although I've largely been talking about the work that he's been doing. Uh, putting a, a, sort of a Java API and a couple of different implementations of the cloud event spec together. Cool. Fantastic. Great to have uh, you and Matthias and everyone over at Red Hat. Um, let's just go ahead and get started with the people who are in the call now. I'm going to do a quick recap since it was almost a month ago that we did it, that we had our last meeting. Um, in our last meeting, that was our first conversation around uh, designing SDKs for cloud events. Um, what prompted that specific conversation was the fact that, hey, we came out with this great specification um, for a common envelope for event data. Uh, the next step, however, is to actually make it easy to put in the hands of developers by building some SDKs. Um, it was, we, we realized uh, after some conversations on the working group call that a lot of people were already making SDKs and we were kind of doing it in an informal um, uh, siloed way. And we said, okay, it's clear we should have a conversation about this to see if we could kind of align all of our implementations on some common goals. Uh, hence, um, that, that inspired the first call. Uh, in that first call, which was on June 25th, we drafted use cases, uh, features, goals for the Cloud Events SDK, and then we ranked them all by priority. Um, and then we organized all those priorities into SDK versions and created a bit of an informal roadmap uh, and then we found some volunteers for implementations across uh, a few languages that we'd like to target. Um, we took that progress, uh, reported it to the CNCF serverless working group. They said, great, it looks great. And, uh, but it's up to us to actually like deliver something. And I think we're, we're getting pretty close right now. So, so hopefully on this call, I was thinking I drafted, <clears throat> I drafted a brief initiative here and I put it in this cloud events design proposal, Google document. And, I'm, it looks like we've already pasted this in the, in the chat room. Yeah, Doug, I did Brian, you? I think Brian already did. The other link is the, is the notes document for the agenda, the, the uh, note, note taking. Cool. Well, yeah, we have been working off this Cloud Events SDK design proposal, Google document. Um, at the very top, I've drafted a pretty lean, loose agenda uh, for this conversation. Uh, we should chat about it real quick in case anyone has any other ideas, but I'll, I'll, read it as is. Um, I figured let's, let's go ahead and check in. Let's see if people, you know, we drafted out some priorities and targeted a scope of work for version uh, 0 0.1 of this SDK. And I think some people have made some progress. So we should share our progress, uh, see, see uh, what people have made. And, you know, it'd be great to share some problems or some learnings along the way. Um, and from there, I think we should, after we hear what, you know, what people have done and where some problem areas are, and where some ambiguity is, let's identify areas that we need to clarify, uh, to clarify further together um, and hopefully achieve greater alignment as a result. Uh, and then after that, it seems like if, it, it, it seems like we have some Cloud Event SDK implementations that are almost ready to go as is, or they might just be very, very close to being ready to go. I think it's time to discuss publishing these to the Cloud Events uh, GitHub org. And Doug is on the line, ready to handle all of, uh, all of our questions about how we're gonna go, uh, go about doing that. So that's the agenda written uh, as is. Does anyone have any suggestions or ideas for other agenda topics that we should discuss on this call? Going once, going twice. All right, let's do this. Let's go ahead and uh, check in with each other and review progress. I was just chatting with uh, Carol about uh, the VMware uh, dispatch uh, cruise progress on doing a Cloud Events SDK implementation is go in Go. And um, uh, maybe we'll start with you, Carol, since you're already all warmed up. 
Sure thing. Uh, let, um, let us know how it's going. Uh, share problems, you know, questions you have. And of course, like what are the, the bleeding from the neck problems that you need to have clarity on so that you can move forward with the implementation and any interesting thing that you've learned. Oh, of course, of course. So I've been, I've been looking at, um, you know, there's a lot of existing Go code for uh, cloud events for version 01 that was, uh, for example, people worked on for the demo uh, that was at the KubeCon. So I've been looking how, how is this being used in different projects. Uh, I'm trying to extract the common layer because, of course, we, we also use uh, cloud events in, in this patch. So the the um, the repo that uh, that we created and then that I posted to the SDK ticket uh, will include um, this work. I've I've pushed some code. Uh, I would say the minimum version of of the event that um, is currently supported. Um, it implements the basic spec, the basic structure of the event, and um, um, HTTP bindings. I think this is the the that like the the minimum. That, that, that I could do now. I think that the, 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 there will be a lot of work to support um, custom content encoding and decoding. Um, I imagine that we would like to support some, some, some sort of a encoders registry, um, but I'm curious what's, what's the approach for other languages. Uh, right now, I only support JSON, since this is the, the most, it seems to be the most common format um, and that everybody uses. Of course, there's a binary and structured mode defined by HTTP binding, so this, so this is easy to support because it's 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 defined there. But I'm sure there will be a lot of um, a lot of formats that people would like to use that are not uh, um, broadly supported by, or, or super popular, but still people people would like to to use. So I imagine there will be some sort of um, registry that um, the users of SDK could register custom encoders and decoders for different content types. Um, with regards to things that I've learned while working on that, um, my initial goal was to to create a some sort of an interface that would be that will help that I thought would be good to 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 you know um, survive different versions of of the spec, right? So. There's a there's a this discussion about removing the extensions bag from the from the spec and have the extensions to be a top level attributes of the of the event of the event context. And I was trying to think what would be the the interface that could handle that, right? What would be the interface that could work the same way with 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 extension bag and without? I know that Doug has some Jason has some work to to um, deal with with this in uh, JSON format. Uh, what happens when you have extensions uh, in the in the separate uh, attribute, and what happens when they're top level? Um, so I was thinking, like, what would be what what would happen if there was a general like a generic getter and setter for those attributes, right? But then you lose the the type safety because if it's generic, then in Go at least you need to do some um, some um, you know unscoped interfaces that that require that are not type safe, uh, or you you need to do some uh, the, um, type checking at the runtime. So this 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 is a I see this as one of the pain points in, in the future. Um, so right now my work is to just uh, address the the version zero one. Um, uh, prepare my my goal is to have you know the the interface or the API that works with version zero one um, and uh, have this you know addressed have this being tested in different use cases so have this work with uh, dispatch hopefully um, work the same way in all the use cases that I see already uh, have tests for that and then see if we can uh, pre you know create a bulletproof interface for future. I don't think we can avoid breaking changes forever because this is never a case, but hopefully um, the interface would be good enough to at least survive this change for where, where the extension back is removed um, and, and have some, uh, some uh, interface that, that supports both, both cases where the extension back is there and it's not there. And um, yeah, so take a look of what's there right now if you're in to go. And um, yeah, that's it. Awesome. So I think the, the interesting thing is how Carl implemented the uh, V01 
uh, specification. Mm -hmm. um, I can share this so I can highlight. Um, while Mark is looking for, for it, um, I, one thing that I would like to talk to you guys is what's the approach for different languages in terms of um, extensions or, well, and I don't mean the spec extensions, but extensions to, to the SDK. Um, for example, things like validation, uh, like extra validation or um, things like I don't know, authentication for different protocols. Should this be in scope of the SDK? Should it not? What should be the like, extent? What about like, you know, project specific extensions or like um, vendor specific extensions? Should they live in the SDK or not? What's the, what's the view on, on that from, from you guys? Yeah, good question. Um, in our research, we, we've got some ideas for that. And definitely a, a good conversation topic that um, we could probably jump into right after we share uh, we share uh, progress. Mark, were you going to finish a thought? Yeah, yeah. So I I, I brought up the the README from that repository, <clears throat> and mm -hmm. you can see that there's a creating a minimal cloud event in version zero point one. Yep. Where you can look at how Carl had implemented. You know, here's how you could define a v01 event and obviously as we version the cloud event spec we would have to continually modify that so the the, the question there is you know is this the in the previous call we had talked about needing to support version interfaces or different versions of the cloud event spec is this the what everyone was intending for it to look like as we uh, go to implement this on both Go and uh, other languages. Sort of. On our end, it's, we, we kind of interpret it this way. We've got a, maybe a few other ideas too. Um, still, we don't have a definitive answer just yet, but a lot of ideas for this. Okay. So uh, my, I, have, I have a thought around that. So uh, given that, uh, you know, you, you uh, some, somewhere when you produce the event first time, you'll have to pick a version of the event that you want to produce. Uh, so, uh, so the event producer will have to decide which version of the event um, the, the producer wants to use. But then the consumer could do a lot of things without knowing the, the actual version, given that a lot of handlers will be there for, for him to, to like a lot of functions that can operate um, on different versions of events are available for him in the SDK itself. Um, so although I've created this package for v01 for the version 01, I'd rather have it without versions code package and have ha like, you know, like think like, I was thinking about like how HTTP was uh, in implemented in Go, like you have HTTP package and the, the um, HTTP2 version uh, support was added to this package without changing the, the you know, there was no version uh, package for it and there was the, the APA changes were minimal or even no changes were made to the, to the uh, interface, and, uh, the basic interface. There are some extra interfaces that you can uh, take advantage of if you need to, but the basic interface is, is the same. Um, I, I hope to have something uh, in the same direction at the moment, it's not what I did. Uh, I was more yeah. trying to implement what people did. Um, basically, you know, here is the V01 spec implemented as it is exactly uh, with all the with all the details. Um, so I packaged it in, uh, in a package of V01, but maybe we can change the direction and have something that is not package scoped, but still is able to uh, deal with different versions under the hood. Yep, I uh, agree with a lot of that, that sentiment. Um, I have a few ideas on this, but I'm gonna wait until it's, it's our turn to share. Um, well, Simon, let's, let's hear uh, on Red Hat's end. Have you guys, I know you guys have been working on a job implementation. Uh, how's that going? And have you learned anything and do you have any major 
uh, problem areas that you need clarity on? Yes, yeah, so so um, so bearing in mind, I've not been the main person working on it. We've got a, a couple of different backend implementations of of the same API, basically one one that's backed by a map um, of all of the uh, to to hold all of the attributes within the within the events, um, and one that's backed with uh, sort of a, a one field per uh, uh, per attribute. <clears throat> um, we were playing around with the map because we thought it might be more extensible and and particularly around sort of versioning might help for sort of for versions past v01 um to for the sort of for a, a client, client library to do something smart in terms of generating right versions uh, for a <clears throat> for a sort of a client application to use the I don't think so. I, I think that probably internally a map is the right way to go um, because of that that benefit to to extensibility for for future versions. Um, the other things that we've been playing around with is that we've we've got sort of the uh, sort of a quick and dirty implementation of a, a kind of gateway that will route events based on the event type to different Kafka queues. Um, uh, use it, it uses CDI to fire events off that are then consumed by different queues and then they can downstream be, be handled in different, different ways. Um, and I, I think sort of based on what I've heard from, from Matthias, he hasn't had any significant problems with the current spec. Um, uh, he hasn't particularly say dealt with versioning apart from looking at how to uh sort of how to make it potentially extensible and uh to future versions um and and i guess the the one of the things that the carol sort of touched on a little bit was sort of adding things in in future in future versions i, I can see how that's straightforward to deal with but taking things away uh, would be more difficult to uh, to deal with sort of backwards compatibility, um, and, and I don't know that Matthias has thought about that a lot. Yeah. Okay. And the I remember in our first call that your Java implementation was public already. Yeah. Um, are you still working on it in that in that public repo? We are. I can uh, hold on. We, we've got two different repos. I'll uh, ping the links on the chat. Uh, give me a second. I think we might have it in here already. Is it? Is yours project stream streamsy? That's the one. So we have J Cloud Events, which was a kind of like a an internal implementation. Um, uh, that's what the. Uh, that's what the kind of the event gateways uh, built on. Then we have an io.cloud events repo that uh, is more of a sort of a, a sort of a, a generic API with, with nothing else there apart from I think there's a builder interface to to build cloud events from from a Java application. Cool. Okay, thanks for sharing. <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll jump in and share some of our progress. We haven't made we haven't made too much. I have an example application in which I'm using cloud events. It's a it's a purely reactive event driven serverless application reference architecture, which uses cloud events throughout uh, for absolutely everything. And I built a simple SDK just to serve that application's needs, but by no means is it. Um, is it something that should be published for the broader community to use because it's focused on a specific application largely. But from there, I, I, did, a, I did, did a few learnings and with chatting um, with the rest of our team and especially Brian, who is our principal architect, who's, who's also on the line. Uh, we have a, a few ideas uh, for this and especially one, one big learning. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen real quick and just show off uh, what we're thinking currently on this SDK and let me know when you could see something. Yep, we got it. Cool. This is like a basic 
user experience that we're targeting for the JavaScript cloud, event, cloud events SDK implementation. Um, it's something that should be ideally as simple as this. You can require in the SDK, you can instantiate an event really easily. Maybe you pass in the version right here. Um, and that event is already filled with same defaults, ideally. And there are simple kind of getters and setter methods uh, to actually manipulate the event. And then lastly, there's this publish method to go send the event or do something with the event. And this kind of simple experience, uh, I think would really resonate with um, a lot of our users, uh, a lot of our jo JavaScript users with the serverless framework. It's very alike um, the super popular application framework called Express that's written in JavaScript. Um, they do the same, have a kind of a similar pattern, but for uh, request and response objects. Um, so anyway, this is kind of the, the customer experience that we're targeting. This doesn't really solve that versioning issue. Like in this example, this would be, I guess this would be like a separate um, type of class with unique getters and setters based on this version. And some of these, again, may not be there uh, if, um, if that version changes and the specification changes and those setters or getters aren't, are no longer needed. Um, would, would you possibly be returning a different type based on the, the version? Returning a different event type? Based yeah, a, on different, a different, a different uh, object based on which version it is. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I was saying. It likely in this pattern that would be the case. I don't think this is an answer to that because you know these things would be would be different. Um, and on that note, I might actually, Brian, do you did you have any thoughts around that versioning problem specifically? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm thinking that at least along the way, uh, along the lines of uh, how other people on this call have approached it. To me, it seems that uh, to me, at least that version uh, uh, potentially is at the, the code level uh, in terms of like where you're, you know, just the, the version that you're, of the, uh, the package that you're bringing in uh, to begin with. Um, I mean, at least I think it's the publisher. You know, the, I can't imagine that a publisher is going to need to publish different versions of the event unless I'm missing something, unless, I, unless we, we can see that there might be reasons why you, you would want to publish both a zero one version and a zero two version and et cetera. Well, actually um, that, that's, that's a good point. I, I feel like there would be reasons for that because if you're a publisher and you have all these subscribers, you can't expect them all to upgrade their code when you upgrade the event, right? You'll probably have to maintain just like in an API scenario, you have to maintain these legacy versions. Fortunately, this is just at the event level and not at the entire API level, but it yeah, seems like I, that would Azure be event problem. grid already has this problem because they're publishing 0.1 on events. Yeah. So you have to worry about the backward compatibility for the lifetime of how long you want to support that service. And is the, I mean, is, is the approach for uh, maintaining backwards compatibility there to effectively publish uh, the same event just in, in multiple different, different version formats? Yeah, I think it, it, so trying not to speak for Clemens, I, sure. you know, more than likely he has some way of mapping from their internal representation to the cloud event format mm -hmm. in order to be able to then transmit it. And so they'd have potentially different ways of mapping that event depending on how we uh, move the spec around. Yeah, but, okay, I fair enough. This, but I think this also goes to the, the conversation that we keep kind of dancing around, which is how are we gonna handle either extensions or future properties that we add, right? Because if we can, do it in such a way that it's always not just backwards compatible, but forwards compatible, then really of say a version 1.0 and a version 1.1, even though 1.1 may have additional attributes, they fall into like the same category as an extension. So it still shows up on a 1.0 implementation of, of a receiver. The only difference would be the cloud event version string is different and they may actually choose to be able to be, they may actually be able to completely ignore that as long as we know how to handle extensions and future properties in almost the same way. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. I think it's really dependent upon whether or not we decide to you know, adhere to sort of the, the concept of Sember there, right? I mean, I guess the thing I'm curious about is, is there ever a reason to effectively have to publish like an 0.1 and a 1.0 and a 2.0? You know, if, you're, if you get into that scenario, then you need ways of potentially being able to bring in 
uh, multiple different uh, you know, formats of that particular event. But I don't, I, if as long as 1.1 is you know, backwards compatible with 1.0, then I don't see a reason why you would ever need to publish both a 1.1 and a 1.0. Now that that said, I do think um, I think the code itself, in terms of how you're interfacing with these kinds of things, uh, would effectively remain the same, right? So you you could bring in you're basically going to be bringing the same package of cloud events into into all of your code, and effectively, if we do need to support different versions of the event, then that should be done at the kind of constructor level, uh, as Austin is suggesting here. Um, but what you would want is just that this thing knows there's going to be a 0 0.1, but the methods and how you, you know, how you write your code, I would imagine would all remain, um, remain the same. And it's up to the underlying event uh, to be able to, to deliver you that resultant format at the end. So I, I wouldn't want someone to have to like generate an 0.1 uh, event and then run through a bunch of code to specifically do things for 0.1 and then do that same thing again with 1.0 you know, and that same thing again with, with 2.0. Instead, you should be able to generate your, your event, apply the properties, and perhaps get you know, back, okay, here's the 0.1 format of that, here's the 1.0 format, and here's the 2.0 format, depending upon which one you need to publish. Well, that would be ideal, absolutely. Um, and I don't know if this is a solution. This is actually, the next thing I'm gonna show is something that we came up with just because we felt it could solve a lot of problems. Um, <clears throat> so I think what's, what's going to set cloud events up for success is how well the community can integrate with it. Uh, how well people can build kind of open source projects to uh, extend cloud events. How well vendors can build uh, integrations into cloud events. Um, so that it integrates with their, their service. And this goes back to the extensions topic, which uh, we've discussed briefly and we need some clarity there. But one thing we've found, and this is Brian's idea, but we think the extensions experience, the, the big learning of this is that the extensions experience should be thought of right in the initial versions of these SDKs. So if we are gonna propose one change to our roadmap, it's that we figure out the extension story. Because we think extensions in addition to just being custom properties within the cloud event envelope, should actually be an experience that is also incorporated into the SDK. And an extension is something that you could bring into the SDK to add like a hook or a middleware into that SDK. Um, so that within that hook, you just bring in that little extension module. And that extension module can manipulate the uh, cloud event data, uh, can do all, all types of stuff with it. Um, so here's kind of a, a basic experience example of this. Uh, extension might be something as simple as this, where you just have like a function, there's an action argument, the event object is passed through, and then maybe there's a next function that you call. So you'd read the action, uh, and maybe this is like what the end user is doing with the Cloud Events SDK. Maybe they just set some data, and this extension, you know, you could say if the action is set, like that means they just set some data and I wanna like look at the events to do maybe one of the following, enforce an organizational policy, uh, set a default for an app or a team or an organization, um, maybe do handle, do some custom encoding uh, for different content types. Um, handling transports isn't really part of that, that specific example. Um, just build any type of uh, open source helper or utility library to manipulate the event, but also add support for vendors. Um, so again, you, you read the kind of the action, what's going on in here, uh, and then you could modify the event or do anything you want with the event as a result of that. And this is like a, a pretty simple concept. Again, it goes back to like Express.js middleware or like uh, Redux, if you're familiar on the front end, of just giving people uh, ways to to modify the event, do extend the SDK, and then within those extensions in the SDK, those extensions could also add properties to the cloud events themselves. Um, and hopefully the community would build some of these. You know, our, our company would love to just build a event gateway uh, extension, for example. And what that extension would look like is it would look like, you know, if there is a publish um, function or method uh, on the event up here, 
um, whenever we would just write an extension like this, so we'd say whenever the action is publish, uh, send this out via the event gateway. Um, publish it to the event gateway and that could route it to different functions as a service. And of course, before publishing it, this extension could also add some data to the cloud events envelope um, for the event gateway to interpret later. So, you know, we, our company would write this thing and then our end users would simply, when they require the SDK, they'd use this, you know, something like an extend method, pass in the extension uh, into it, our event gateway extension, and automatically, whenever they instantiate a new event or something like that, that extension would just be baked in. Um, all the extensions would be baked in so that the developers don't really have to think about a lot of things. So other example for this is in my application, in my reference architecture that I'm making, I'm starting to put application specific information within the envelope, um, within the cloud events envelope. I wanna put like the app title, I wanna put the stage of the application, I wanna put um, maybe auth information uh, for that application. And I'd love to just make a application, some type of app extension, uh, where people can just set some custom properties here, like the name, you know, auth info, stuff like that. And that app extension could always like prefix the event type with like the title of the application, you know, no matter what. Um, it could do a lot of stuff and add application specific properties to the cloud events envelope. Um, and it would be a very convenient experience. Again, you know, this, that app extension could be an open source project. People just bring it in and it would really bring kind of application features to, to cloud events. Again, they just pass it in like this. You, you just add it in once and then every event you instantiate will have all that stuff uh, baked in. Is this a solution um, for enforcing organizational policies? We think so. Whenever you set data, you should write an extension. Your, your org can write an extension to check that data, make sure it's formatted correctly. Setting defaults for an app team or org, absolutely. Um, now, custom encoding, handling encoding issues, perhaps, uh, perhaps extensions could do this, like on the, on the publish um, action, for example. Um, now handling kind of different transports, you know, yeah, I think on publishing, absolutely. Um, and perhaps this extension solution is, I don't know if this could be applied to solve the versioning problem too, but yeah, I haven't really thought about it, just, just thinking out loud there. But anyway, I, our biggest learning is like, thinking about this experience should be one of the first things that we consider um, when designing the SDK. Because if we could create a great extension extensibility story for cloud events, and we have that in the specification, we need to carry that into the SDK, that is gonna be fuel for community growth, for vendor support, for, for an ecosystem to grow around this thing. So that's, um, yeah, that's it on our end. We're targeting this user experience. We learned that extensions are super important. We like to think about them in advance and it's bigger than just custom data. Yeah, I, I like the idea in particular. Uh, I think it implies then that there's some sort of uh, agreement or a set of specifications around these extensions so that people who write the extensions for each various language can adhere to that specification. That way, regardless of what language someone's using, they can get a similar experience, assuming everybody tries their best to try to implement all those extension specs uh, for each of the various languages we support. So they get some level of uh, I don't know if interoperability is the right word, but consistency across the languages and stuff. I think that would be really, really cool. That's a good, good point, Doug. I mean, I guess there's a, a question in there of once you start going cross language, um, uh, I agree that this consistency is nice from the perspective of the ha having a level of familiarity. Uh, but there's also clearly just you know, significant differences between languages that can make that uh, relatively challenging. Um, and certainly, I think the way that a JavaScript developer thinks about uh, doing these kinds of things versus the way that a Java developer uh, thinks about them, uh, they're often you know, worlds apart to some degree. Um, and it'd be nice to effectively be able to take it, at least to form things in the way that those communities are familiar with. Oh yeah, I definitely agree that the way that they'll be presented to the user may look radically different in some cases, but if the same uh, features are available across languages, I think that's gonna be the big benefit to the user. Yeah. Or develop. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that's a hard I, thing to for us to maintain. I mean, just, just ensuring that we get parity at uh, a language level is probably going to be up to the implementer of the extension to begin with to say, yes, we support these and we, you know, we're doing our best to, to produce it in every language. I just I would just say that this idea addresses a lot of my uh, 
concerns or questions that I had at the very beginning. Um, so yeah, I definitely like the idea of, of having this into the SDK and having this. And this also aligns with what I said, you know, that in, it's not only the, the event specification, it's more about what you can do with it. And like the extensions will uh, be the, 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 the way to, to do something with it so that different versions of events won't matter that much if you have the common interface of saying what you want to do with, with those. Cool. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Unless, uh, unless Doug or, or Brian or anyone else wants to share anything, any other thoughts? No, we don't, we don't have code yet other than the code I wrote for the demo. So nothing big to share yet. Okay. Yeah, I'm good on, on my end. <clears throat> cool. Sorry, Austin, can I jump in again for a second? Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, uh, the other thing that, that we did that I, I completely forgot about was um, there's, some, there's some technology called the Heptio Event Router, which is a, um, uh, it's a Kubernetes, uh, something that sits on top of Kubernetes and, and uh, emits events based on kind of what's happening inside Kubernetes. We, so we deployed that on OpenShift um, and the the events that come out of the Heptio event router are a little bit odd to say the least, but um, we we deployed a, a, a watcher for those events and then um, used the uh, so used the library on screen now is um, is a sort of an example of how we use the so the, S, the Java SDK to uh, to turn the the data events so the Heptio events into uh, uh, into cloud events um, and then we <clears throat> so th this is a sort of a, a helper class and then we publish those onto a, a Kafka topic so we had a at least from a sort of a builder perspective, not a not a dissimilar um, uh, sort of developer experience from um, uh, uh, sort of from your your JavaScript uh, sort of API developer experience. Yeah, I can see it here. It looks it looks really good. Um, I say that the the kind of the content of their events is a little bit a little bit funky. Um, but uh, uh, they only have two event types, and so we, we try to split out their event types into things that make a bit more a bit more sense for a, a sort of a consumer of those events that might be interested in different different topics. Um, uh, but we we found that sort of a sort of generally what we built in a Java SDK kind of made sense, um, uh, and then those could be consumed downstream by different subscribers to the Kafka topics. Cool stuff. Okay, moving along here. Our second agenda item was to identify areas where we need clarity and further alignment. It sounds like we have two big ones, and let me know if I'm missing any here, but just extensions, like trying to figure out how the extension story carries into the SDK, um, and also where those uh, extension properties are gonna end up at the end of the day. Um, and then versioning, how do we build this in a way that's future-proof? Um, anything else that were clear uh, problem areas that we need to we need to figure out right now at this stage? I, I have a question uh, with re related to the the bindings. So um, I guess it's 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 just the nature of of how the the standard looks like right now. But um, we have. We have spec, which is 0 0.1, version 0 0.1. We have HTTP binding, which is version 0 0.1. Um, they seem to be version independently, uh, but are they, or will the, this is probably more a question to Doug maybe and, and Mark, are they version independently or they will always be a version together? Or what's the idea? Because I'm asking because you know the, the bindings, for example, um, the HTTP binding specifies how the extensions are carried, okay, but I, I imagine that if extensions are not in the, the bag, but are top level, the, the, the binding must change as well. So they're kind of 
um, they depend on each other. So I'm curious what the story there. So I guess, I guess I kind of always assume that while there's different specifications and they may have slightly different life cycles in terms of like the, the core spec could be released maybe, you know, once every six months, the HTTP spec could be released more often, right? So there may be some difference there, but I always kind of assume that they always are within the scope of say version one, right? And, and they're sort of from that perspective always grouped together. And that if we ever wanted to radically change the HTTP spec, it would almost have to be a completely new HTTP spec that's completely different from the current HTTP spec. Got that's it. A, that's Very, a fair. That's it's a rarely major split. That's a fair point, Doug. But I, th I mean, I think the question is, is kind of interesting because it leads us down a, a path of where you know the you may have a specific version in the event that still adheres to you know o dot one o dot two etc. Whereas the binding in terms of how it's delivered has entirely changed. How do we reconcile that with kind of the versions in the SDK, which you know, are, are we going to need to be able to bring in, you know, a binding version separately from the, the event, uh, you know, uh, the code that's responsible for generating the event itself? And that seems like that's getting pretty complicated at that point. Yeah, I don't know. I, this maybe, I, honestly, I think we just need to think more about this because I, I mean, if we change the HTTP binding so radically, like for example, let's say we get rid of a, 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 the extensions bag, right? And they all, all extensions now become top level things for the JSON coding or HTTP. That's a radical change. And even if the core spec didn't change, people are gonna think this isn't a 1.0 anymore. This is a 2.0. And maybe we need to think that, you know, maybe a binding or a transport change does bump up the core spec version. I, I don't know. We have to think about this because it's, the, I, I love for them to be independent, but maybe they really can't be. I, I just don't know. Yeah, I mean, it has implications on on the consumer side as well because you know you suddenly if you were to if you were to get 1.0 events or, or as you're describing you know 2.0 events that looked exactly like 1.0 events. So let's let's say the binding change was that instead of using CE as a prefix on headers, you know, we used you know the whole cloud events word as as prefix. So this changes radically the way that we, we think about the binding, but the event ends up looking the, the exact same at the end of the day. Yep. In that particular case, a version change to the event actually could be relatively annoying to the consumer side, um, whereas you know, really the only thing that really needs to know about that change is the SDK. Yeah, I, I don't know. How, does anybody have any experience on how other people deal with this? Other specs that deal with the, uh, you know, schema versus transport specifications. Mm -mm. So, so the way I see that is is kind of the the problem with the transport right now is that in structured mode, in structured mode you have the envelope which is does not depend on the actual you know actual structure of the of the of the of the event. So the so the spec it doesn't depend on the spec itself. Uh, because uh, it, it it grabs the entirety of of the spec and packages in this in this in the body of the like I'm talking about the HTTP uh, HTTP bindings, but it packages the entire body of the event and and it's it doesn't depend on the structure. Whereas in the binary mode, because we have to inspect the structure um, of the event where the context uh, is is treated in, uh, differently, um, like extensions are treated differently, then it um, it causes this problem, right? If it wasn't the case, there was no problem. Or if the envelope that uh, the basically the transport envelope, if it grabs everything, then you know it 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 kind of is independent of the the thing it carries. Um, I'm thinking even if we remove the extension bag in the binary mode and you have you know the top level attributes for the extensions, what happens if like I understand that extensions at the moment they support values like keys are strings, but values can be objects. How those objects are encapsulated into um, into the headers? Uh, this is another it, it, it's it's another uh, surface where the where the spec leaks to the transfer binding, right? It 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 causes this leak that that um, uh, transport transport has to handle, and because of that, it depends on the spec. So I don't know if, if we will be ever to, able to address it fully um, 
if we support the binary mode, like if the binary mode, like binary mode is kind of tied to the spec version, whereas the structured mode seems to be uh, independent of the spec version. At least that's what I see at the moment. I have to think about that. I'm not sure if I agree or disagree. <laughs> it's, always, it's a complicated question. Yeah, of course. It, it, it goes way beyond the SDK, uh, um, SDK scope. So I guess it's a... Uh, yeah. But, that, but it is a good topic. And I'll, I'm going to add to the agenda for tomorrow's call, not necessarily because I don't think we come to a resolution on tomorrow's call, but I think people need to start thinking about this and come back with ideas. I'll call it one other uh, kind of interesting angle here. So. Let's assume that, um, again, not everybody's going to keep up with the, the latest versions of uh, the specification. And I want to effectively be able to write code that could potentially publish to you know, something that adheres to the 1.0 specification and something that adhere in terms of transport binding and something that adheres to the you know, 0.1 uh, without having to, to change out my code. Um, how does the SDK know which version it's needing to publish based upon uh, the system that it's communicating with, or, or how does it know how it needs to talk to it? Could that be covered in, a, in an extension? Well, the, I guess the point is, is if you're wanting to, to be agnostic about it, right, um, you're, you almost lose that ability or you need some method to effectively be able to know, okay, this endpoint I'm trying to reach, which version of cloud events do you speak? You know, are you speaking, do you speak 0.1 or do you speak 1.0? Uh, Cause I, then I that affects. That, I never thought that there'd be protocol negotiation for version. I didn't think so either, that, but I'm just, yeah. Just I, kind of I, calling just, out. I, I just consider the events being asynchronously sent out and decoupled from any, uh, you know, transport level communication, getting it from one place to another. Well, but so take the SDK's you know case. Uh, if if I wanted to be able to write code agnostically that worked with you know the event gateway and works with Azure Event Hub, for instance, and one of them is still on 0.1 and the other one's on 1.0, uh, do I effectively you know, need to write? two separate lines of code and switch based upon where I'm trying to send it to, or is there a method that it can figure out, you know, hey, uh, I know I need to send a, you know, this over the 1.0 uh, transport specification here, and here I need to send it over the 0.1. Yeah, so I think this is an interesting problem in the sense that I think it, it seems to me that once, once we have a version, I guess we don't have version 1.0, but it seems to me that once we have a version of one zero version of, of, of cloud events, then consumers who commit to support those one, one, zero, one zero version will have to support it practically forever in the sense that transport might change and maybe that there might be a, a negotiation in the transport layer and probably there will be a transport negotiation because then we are talking about two entities that can negotiate or in terms of HTTP binding, we have this mm -hmm transport negotiation, whether it's one zero, one one, or two zero. But in the context of even version, I think it's just impossible to, to um, negotiate that uh, because of the asynchronous nature of, of events. So it seems to me that version one zero of event spec will have to be supported for. I don't see how it would not be like. Well, well they, I, again, that's assuming that you're directly talking between the publisher and the consumer. and more than likely these events are going on to, you know, some event bus uh, being queued into some system for, for delivery asynchronously. And so you won't be able to get that level of uh, translation. Yeah. If, any, well, if anything, yeah. it's going to be up to kind of a middleware that's delivering it between the consumer, between the producer and the consumer. It will say, oh, I know that all of my consumers are at this back. I'm getting this, you know, potentially a 1.0 event coming in, but my consumers are 0.1, maybe I need to down ref the event and be able to do a translation of that in middleware. Exactly. So there is a middleware, right? So is, there is a middleware which is affected by the transport binding. So that middleware has to know, 
can negotiate the transport uh, binding or whatever the transport version is used, right? It can negotiate with the with the producer, mm -hmm. with the consumer can negotiate that. What they cannot negotiate is the events version or the the what what is being carried, uh, and this will like the middleware will be responsible of ensuring that whatever it delivers to will be able to uh, it will be able to deliver it. So in in certain cases, it would have to convert the event between versions, right? Uh, like the middleware's responsibility would be to convert those versions in case it's the consumer of this middleware doesn't know how to support certain version of of the event. Yeah, this and that makes certainly makes sense to me. I mean, I think it's between the the SDK and the middleware, uh, the really only the the only version that they really need to be aware of there is just how they're speaking to each other. So how they're you know, the, the transport binding itself. Uh, but you're right. You have then the middleware needs to take over from that point and understand the consumers and understand which version of the event they're expecting. Yeah. But uh, maybe I'm not following properly, but I would have thought that sort of each hop along the way here is almost like a completely independent uh, transport of a cloud event, right? So from the event producer to whatever piece of middleware, that, that event producer is going to have to choose some version of CE and then some transport related to the cloud event and send it across. And then that middleware is going to have to accept it in that format and then it may do some translation. I mean, it might even translate it to cloud event version 2.0, you know, and with, with the completed and binding. And that's, it's just to my mind, it's just a, another hop along the way, but each hop does its own translation and needs to figure out how it's going to send it. And mm -hmm. I kind of view how it decides how it's going to send it is almost out of scope for us, even in the SDK world. The SDK just needs to provide the mechanism for someone to specify what version of cloud event, what version of the HTTP binding. But it's not necessarily our responsibility to figure out how that information gets given to us from the event receiver. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree that's that's mm -hmm. part of the scope of the, of the, of the SDK. I guess it, the discussion came from the fact that we needed to clarify that. <laughs> On, on that note, I'm, I'm just going to move along here because we're running out of time. Um, it seems like we've identified a few areas. Uh, versioning is, is an issue. There's a couple of versioning areas we need to figure out. Uh, cloud event spec and SDK uh, mismatch. I'm not sure if we had found any solutions for that just yet. And the spec, cloud event spec and the transport binding spec um, might, be, might be some issues there as well. I'm not sure. Uh, as well as the extensions stuff. So, um, with respects to extensions, I just want to, maybe we can get to some resolution here. Do we feel that thinking about extensions in advance in this initial version is a good idea? I don't, I don't think there is a way not to think that about them. I, I currently, I'm kind of blocked by not, uh, not knowing how to address that. So I think it's, it's uh, something that we should address. Yeah, I agree. This is, this to me is like security. Um, you need to kind of think about it up front to make sure you can plug in the right stuff later on, even if you don't necessarily define it all right, right up front. You have, the right, you have to have the right hooks in place. Okay. All right, it sounds like we have a bit of a scope change there for this 0 0.1 milestone. So something for everyone who's, who's implementing this to think about uh, how, to, how to support that extension experience uh, up front. Um, so I'm gonna add that into the Cloud Events SDK version 0 0.1. And at the same time, I, I think we're at a, at a good point where centralizing these efforts in the cloud events uh, org um, would be helpful. So we have like one place to look for all these things and we'll make it very clear. These things are not production ready. These things are currently works in progress, but I do think having them in one place so that everyone can kind of observe our progress and look at the various implementations would be helpful. Um, Doug, do you have any suggestions as to how we can go about doing that? Yeah, so as you and I were talking about earlier, I think um, if we create a single repo for everybody to put their work into, I think that might be a good a starting place. That way people have a single place to go look for it, and that's irrespective of what language they're going to be implementing it or using. Um, I know that some people may want to have a separate repo per project. I think if we have everything under the same repo, while it may cause some noise in terms of issues, pull requests, and emails and stuff, I think being in the same repo helps ensure, or at least encourages the possibility of us all staying aligned uh, as best we can. Um, that way we don't get some project going off in a completely different direction. Um, at some point we may choose to split it out because things maybe get too busy, but I think initially if we could start out with a single repo to put these things, I think that might be a good place to start. Yeah, 
especially in the design phase, because I think centralizing the conversation yep. around the design yeah. in like a, in a single ish, repo issues area would be would be helpful too. Yeah, can, I, can, I agree. With can I can I parse what you just said, Doug? Yeah. Did, sorry. They, did you say a single repo for all of these, or as a starting point, yes, a single repo under the Cloud Events org. It would have multiple languages in it. Yes. I, I, know, I, saw that face. <laughs> I, I see a problem with I that. I did that on purpose. <laughs> I see a problem with that later, like with Go, because the the way that Go works and how the things are packaged, that they will download everything, including other languages. But I think, mm -hmm. I think at the beginning, when when we start, the value that Austin and Doc said, I think the value is there, and so I'm I'm okay with that. I mean, we could have one repository for storing, like you know, a set of readme's and descriptions and those kinds of things. And then if we need to separate out the code into separate repos, I think that would be acceptable as well. Yeah, I was going to say something similar, Brian. I think if we get to the point, but not if, when we get to the point where we have a common document that describes how extensions should work at a functional level, and then, you know, how we def how uh, the different set of extensions that we define should look across all languages so that uh, I think that does make it more possible for us to then yes, split it out to some repos because then people are saying, okay, this repo over here adheres to those specifications to find in the common repo. But since we don't have that quite yet, I'm not sure we could do that quite at this point in time. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Um, great, we made a decision there, it sounds like. Doug, if you can set this stuff up so that we can start pushing things to it. Um, that would be helpful. Maybe we could be in a good place to do that uh, tomorrow. Yeah, good, good, good question for you. Do you want the repo to be called SDK or SDKs? And that's where the meeting goes for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll flip a coin. The, it's up to you, Doug. Use your, use your excellent judgment. Oh, we're screwed right there. Okay, got it. <laughs> Cool. All right. All right. Yeah. So let's let's just present our progress. We'll give an update tomorrow during the uh, during the work group call, and you know maybe Doug will have some have instructions for us. He could share them on the call, and then we'll start pushing things, and everybody in the work group can follow along a bit more easily. Um, so in the meantime, yeah, let's think about extensions. Let's think about this uh, versioning these versioning issues, and also discuss them within the broader working group. Sounds good. Yep. Thanks, Austin. Thanks all. Thank, Thank you all. Good work. Take care. Thanks a lot.